Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship Live. I'm Pastor Daryl Chilson and this evening's study is the second in a series of studies that addresses the question, what does the Bible have to say about what's happening in our world today? I hope it's an interesting subject for you and I'm wondering, perhaps that question has crossed your mind in recent days. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to pray before we begin. Father in heaven, thank you for your holy word, for the scriptures which you've given us. Thank you for the picture we have of you in this book and of the information that you've given us that we might know and understand things about ourselves, things about you, things about things that are going on in the world. I pray that your spirit will be present tonight as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as I've been looking at the Word of God the last several hours preparing for tonight's message, I cease to be amazed. I cannot possibly be more amazed at what an incredible book God has given us. It's so incredible that so many different human authors could put together and co-author one book that is so congruent and is so contiguous. Everything looking back and agreeing with that which is before. Tonight, God has blessed us with this book. Every page has the imprint of his finger, his hand upon it. Every page shows his face. And tonight, we are privileged to be able to study his word. There are two texts that I would like to look at right off the start, right at the beginning. The first one is in 2 Peter chapter 1. And it begins with verse 20. It says, No prophecy of Scripture is of any private origin for prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit the second verse which comes from John chapter 16 and verse 13 says Jesus speaking to his disciples the night of his arrest Jesus says when he the Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth, and he will tell you things to come. In our last study, we learned that prophecy is not a mystery. It doesn't have to be a mystery. God wants us to know what is going on in our world today and what we can expect in the future, in the days that precede his glorious return. Prophecy is interpreted and understood by looking throughout the scriptures because the Bible interprets itself. Jesus told his disciples that they should know the signs that tell of his soon return. And when we don't understand perhaps things that he says, when they come to pass, he wants us to remember that he told us. In Matthew 24 is a template for us to understand all that has to do with the end times. We studied that about Matthew 24. We actually studied Matthew 20, 24 in our last session. And we learned that Matthew 24 is like a watermark like a template, like a skeleton on which all the rest of prophetic writings can be interpreted and things can be added to in detail. The other prophecies of the Bible actually add detail to what Jesus said in Matthew 24. We have a brand new recording of our study on Matthew 24 on YouTube, and I hope that you will look at that perhaps 
tonight, perhaps tomorrow sometime, so that you can have this first session of our series of studies in prophecy to accompany our talk tonight. Tonight, we want to look at Revelation 6 and put Revelation 6 right on top of Matthew 24. There are so many similarities. This is one example of how one portion of Scripture is enlightened and, and interpreted and more information is given us in another portion of Scripture. As we take prophecy and put it one layer upon another, the skeleton of Matthew 24 fleshes out. Matthew 24 is our master template for understanding all of Bible prophecy. Don't forget that, Matthew 24. And then as we look at various other pieces of scripture, we just lay it right over the top of Matthew 24 and we can actually see more detail than what Jesus gave us in that short discourse. So let us look at Revelation chapter six. But before we do, I want you to know that the picture that God gives us in Revelation of Jesus, the revelator, really, the one who gave the revelation to John so that he would write these things, there is a passage of scripture in Revelation one that talks about Jesus. It is so beautiful that I want to read it as sort of an introduction to our study. Revelation 1, beginning with verse 4. Listen to this glorious description of the author, the real author of the book of Revelation. John writes to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. What does that say? One who is eternal and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. We have the Father represented in this eternal being and then we have the Spirit represented. It says seven spirits. One of these times we will actually talk about the sevens which are so prevalent not only in the book of Revelation, because there are many, but throughout the scriptures, the number seven has great significance. In Revelation, we have seven churches. We have seven stars. We have seven candlesticks. We have seven seals. And we're gonna study the seals tonight. There are seven trumpets. There are seven thunders. There are seven plagues. Seven is a number that represents completeness. And so we have the Father represented here in verse four. From him, peace and grace, from him who is and who was and who is to come, the eternal Father. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And then he says, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. You know, the first verse we read spoke of the Father as being eternal. He who is, who was, and who is to come. Jesus is eternal with the Father as well. And he also is described as one, the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Remember in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, that Christmas passage where Jesus is spoken of, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name, 
And it goes on and lists various titles for Jesus, one of which is the Father and the Almighty. Jesus is one with the Father. The Spirit and the Father and the Son are one. And this is just a brief description of the one that we see throughout the book of Revelation. This is the one who is present. And I'd like for you to see a picture of Jesus as he is described in the rest of chapter one, as he walks among the candlesticks, which represent the churches or the church as a whole, the composite of the church. The stars that are in his hand are the leaders of, the, of those churches, and he holds them in his hand. Jesus is present in all of the, the events of Revelation. Jesus is among us in all that we experience as we approach the end of time. Jesus is there. We can be confident that he is with us during the hard times and during the awesome times, especially as we see his return in the heavens. So let's go back to Revelation chapter five, where Jesus is the one who is who, who we are told actually opens the seals that we are going to look at in Revelation 6 tonight. In Revelation 5, and we're going to read the first five verses, we have a picture of heaven. And, well, let me read it. In Revelation chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that is the Father, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? That angel was likely Gabriel. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So John says, I wept much because no one was found to open and read the scroll or to look at it. John is watching this in his in a vision. Verse five says, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who is that? Jesus Christ has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So Jesus is the one who opens the seals, and in verse one of chapter six, and we're going to go now to chapter six, and we're going to read, and you will see that on your screen. John chapter six, the first two verses. Who is identified as the one who opens the seals? Verse one says, Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice, like thunder, come and see, come and see. This is incredible, this is awesome, this is important to see what Jesus is going to open up. And it is important to us. Verse two says, and I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on the horse had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. The first four seals of Revelation 6, because this is a discourse on the seven seals, the seventh of which is actually recorded in chapter 8, but chapter 6 records information for us about the first six seals. And the first four of those seals are riders on four horses. Now this is kind of important for you to hear. As we look through these verses, through verse eight, we see four different horses and riders on four different horses. And each horse is a particular color. 
the color of each horse symbolizes the activity of the rider. That's an important piece of this puzzle. The color of the horse symbolizes the activity of the rider. And you will see as we go. The rider on the white horse? Who is the rider on the white horse? Well, it's not Jesus, but it is Jesus. It's Jesus in the person of his people. Jesus is the one that's opening the seals, but white represents his church. Church dressed in white raiment. It speaks of that in, in the book of Revelation. God's bride is dressed in white. And Jesus is the person, symbolically, on the horse in the person of his people. It's his people that are riding through the earth, going forth, conquering, and to conquer. It is the experience of the church during this time. What are they doing during this time? Well, what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. This is the experience of the church taking the story of Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the essence of prophecy. Essence of prophecy is the story of Christ and what it means to us and the implications it has for us and our eternal destiny. The rider on the white horse is Jesus in the person of his people. Let's look next at verse three and four, where we have the second seal. And it says in verse three, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see, again. This is something notable. This is something to be seen. This is incredibly important. Come and see, he said. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So, we could say, perhaps, that this represents battle between nations, but what it really says, and it can be both, I believe, what it really says is this rider is taking peace from the earth. That's what I want us to notice. The very words that are used in this prophecy, the rider on the, white, on the red horse takes peace from the earth. There is a sword in his hand, and there is blood on that sword. People killing people. I don't know if you have ever felt like peace has been taken from the earth. There have been times in recent years for me when I felt as if the rider on the white, I'm sorry, on the red horse had left the stable and was on his ride through the earth because it seemed as if peace had been taken from the earth. So we have a white horse which is charging through the earth, the people of God carrying the gospel message, the testimony of Jesus Christ with power conquering and to conquer for the kingdom of God. And we have a red horse with a rider with a sword in his hand who is taking peace from the earth. That is the second seal. And now we look at verses five and six, the third seal. And it says in verse five, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, what? Come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. 
This writer represents the presence of famine, the presence of scarcity on the earth. And even though the horse is black, I believe there is a reason the horse is black. I'm not sure that I want to talk about that exactly tonight because that is part of a future study. But there is a reason this is a black horse. And the rider is bringing famine upon the earth, scarcity upon the earth. It is the consequence of his activity, his blackness and famine. Now let's go to verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and grave followed with him. And power was given to them, them, that is, the rider on the pale horse, and on the red horse, and on the black horse. Power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with what? Sword, with hunger, and with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Pestilence, death, famine, sword. These are the three seals that bring hardship on the residents of this earth, the people of this world. So, since Matthew 24 is the template on which we are placing these prophecies, this prophecy of the seals, the four seals, and then we will get to the rest of this chapter in a moment. Let's look at the slide, which shows the comparison of Matthew 24 with Revelation 6. What do you see? You see the elements in Matthew 24, the gospel going to the world, famine, pestilence, death, these things parallel the prophecy of John in the book of Revelation under the seals. They, it's just so fascinating to see it. Again, this is a mastermind behind the writing of this word, a mastermind. And he has enabled us to take scripture and compare it with other scripture and see the likenesses and learn more about each passage by comparing verses with verse. So we find that in this chart that, that you have before you. Matthew 24, the events of Matthew 24 that Jesus gave us in his discourse. And then we have the events of the seals, the four seals, the first four seals delineated there in, Ma in Revelation chapter 6. Now, I'd like to show you another slide. This slide is a slide that I tried to show you a week ago when we did study similar to this of waves. In Matthew 24, and in the prophecies of Scripture, we find a phenomenon that is important for us to notice. We find that as one event transpires, another follows behind it, contiguous with the first. It's like waves that are on their way to the shore, on their way to the end of their life as waves. One wave comes toward shore. Behind it is another wave. Behind it is another wave. And each wave is connected to the one before, but follows in sequence. Each one of these waves represents various tiers of these prophecies that we have talked about. They're like waves that come 
And this is a principle that we see throughout the study of prophecy in the Bible. When we study the trumpets, which we will do one of these days soon, you will see how the trumpets fall into line with the seals. They actually begin after the seals have already started. The trumpets come along as another wave. And then we have another segment of time. Remember in Matthew 24, what did we have? We had a time of trouble. Then we had the great tribulation, which began during the time of trouble. It just intensified. And then toward the end of the great tribulation, we had signs in the heavens that foretold the coming of Christ. And then everything ended together on one note with the great, incredibly beautiful coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. Everything ended at the same time, but it began in waves as we go through each of those segments or tiers of prophecy. Now I'd like to look at the last verses of this chapter. These are hard verses in a way because they represent what's happening to the people of God as they are storming through the earth under the power of the Holy Spirit, taking the message of the end and the message of the gospel to the world. A message that includes warning about the coming of Christ. In fact, there's a verse in Revelation 14 that says, and I saw an angel flying through the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel and saying, everyone, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So we have, this is the experience of the people of God as they are moving through the earth like this rider on the white horse, Jesus is their leader and he is the one in whom they live and move and go with power with a message to the earth. So this is a story that has with it a lot of difficulty because wherever the gospel is preached, there's trouble. Yeah, I heard one person say one time, wherever the gospel is preached, there's either revival or riot. And that's the experience of Jesus. That's the experience of Paul. That's the experience of the reformers. That's the experience of many people throughout history. When they have gone before the world with a message, a message that proclaims Jesus Christ and lifts him up, people are stirred. They are stirred in their hearts to respond toward God, or they are stirred in animosity to the messenger. And so this is what's happening in these last verses of chapter six. Let's read them together. And I'm just going to read them from the scriptures. And as I do, I would like for you to see a picture of Jesus that will it is so inspiring. It's, it's a slide that I found to give you a picture of tonight. I wanted you to see one of my favorite scenes of Jesus. And I'm going to read to you these last verses, and then I'm going to make some comments about those verses. We begin in verse nine. The Bible says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them. Jesus is still in this picture, don't forget. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. And then I looked when he opened the sixth seal. 
This is the, the rescue that comes to the persecuted people of God at the end. This is the rescue. Jesus Christ on a white horse with the armies of heaven following him. I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Do you remember the imagery of Matthew 24 that parallels this? And then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Think about this. These are the ones who have been opposing the messengers of God as they have stormed through the earth with the message of Christ, the message of his return, the message of Babylon. We find this also in Revelation chapter 14. They are carrying a message that is intended to prepare people for the coming of Jesus Christ. And they have been opposed and they have been persecuted. And who but Jesus Christ himself on a white horse comes out of the heavens with the armies of heaven to rescue those who are his. It's so interesting, and I'd, I'd just like to go back to Matthew chapter 24 for just a moment, because in this chapter we have, it says in, in Matthew 24, verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man appeared in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Revelation tells us with the armies of heaven. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth. Those who have been carrying his message to the world under fierce opposition of the enemy and his agents. The armies of heaven come to rescue them and take them back to the place that God has prepared for us. Them is us. Them is us. What a beautiful picture, a beautiful promise. I want to be a part of that movement. How about you? I want to be a part of that movement. I want to be one of those soldiers of Christ that carry the message of the gospel and of the soon return of Jesus Christ to the world. I want to be one of them. How about you? I'd like to pray now as we end this session. Father in heaven, what an amazing picture of those things which are to come. Father, give us the privilege of being a part of that mighty movement that is represented by the rider on the white horse. Lord God, move upon our hearts, inspire us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and drive us, compel us to be the messengers that carry your message to the ends of the earth before you come. We look forward to that day when you will come out of the heavens with all of the armies of heaven and rescue us, and take us back to the land that you have prepared for us to enjoy throughout eternity. I pray these things in Jesus' name.
Amen.